Let's take a further look at Redox here and get into chapter 13.2. And in this one, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about that agency idea as we start looking at OAs and RAs. Something you might want to highlight and maybe even uh, add to page 7 of your data booklet. All right, we have a data table that we're going to be using here quite a bit over the next little while. All right, is this information that there is an electron transfer. Again, that is our theory for this whole unit. Electrons transfer from one place to the other. We know that oxidation means that you are going to lose electrons in that process. And we also know that reduction means we're going to gain electrons in that process. Looking at it from the agency point of view, remember the reducing agent causes uh, reduction of something else. So it must be the one undergoing oxidation. Okay, and therefore my electrons are lost going somewhere, in this case, to the OA. And the OA causes oxidation in something else, therefore it must undergo reduction. So it was that whole idea of two sides of the very same coin. It all depends on how you want to look at it, either from the processes or from the label of agency. And what we're going to find is that OA and RA become a little bit easier for us, uh, especially as we start off. Uh, looking at how to come up with these redox equations. So, electron always transfers from RA to OA. The RA is going to be the one that is uh, undergoing oxidation, and the OA is the one that gets reduced. Okay, I know it's kind of confusing when you hear those terms back and forth, back and forth. Uh, like that. But remember, it is, again, imagining uh, a coin or something like that, something that has two sides. Hey, here's the front of my calculator. That's oxidation reduction. Hey, same calculator, but here now we have OARA information, and it's just looking at it from a different perspective. So if we take a look at the example further down the page here, this is one we saw in 13.1, in which we looked at the net ionic equation between uh, silver and copper 2 nitrate. And in that one, we found out that silver, being a positive entity, becomes neutral over here. To go from positive or neutral must mean that you are gaining electrons, and so that is reduction. Okay, things that like to gain electrons make good OAs, and so between a neutral metal and a positive metal ion, it kind of makes sense that this guy would want to attract and take electrons, so silver is the OA here. Conversely, copper ends up losing two electrons as you move uh, from reactant to product. So therefore, we would say it is oxidized as it's lost these electrons. And therefore, things that want to lose their electrons, as we saw, are generally your RAs. So it makes sense to label copper as the RA as well. So we can see the process here for each one. We can also describe them by agency. And so something to help you out because we're going to want to try and come up with the idea of what is likely an OA, what is likely an RA. In other words, what likes to gain electrons and what likes to lose them. You can see the metals. If you think about what you know from chemistry 10 and chemistry 20, metals were things that had very few valence electrons. So they liked to lose electrons or give them to other more electronegative things, which means they were often oxidized and make really good reducing agents. Your non-metal ions, okay, these would be your negative ions like bromide and chloride. They have extra electrons. Negative particles don't want to attract other negative electrons very easily. All right, the law of charges still dominates here. And so there are other things that like to give up electrons and become oxidized in chemical reactions and therefore make good RAs. The OAs, that would make sense to us. Metal ions, which have positive charges, are things that like to attract electrons. And your nonmetals, with their nearly full valence and that small atomic radius, are also really good at attracting electrons. So your reducing agents like to lose them. Your oxidizing agents like to accept them. And therefore, they are oxidized and reduced, respectively. Okay, so you can uh, rely on this as we start to uh, go down this pathway here. And after a little while, it will all start to uh, kind of make sense again. We're not talking so much about electro electronegativity. We're not taking a look at, you know, chem 10 ionic compounds as much anymore. We will start to get more and more familiar with OA and RA as our designations as things that like to gain or lose uh, electrons respectively.
So one of the first ways we're going to take a look at this is we're going to take a look at uh, this idea of spontaneity, which is just an idea that all reactions happen automatically. We know that's likely not the case. Some are easier than others. We kind of have that as a holdover from uh, the thermochemistry unit. And what we're going to do is we're going to develop a redox table. We're going to take a look at the relative strength that we have for certain things to both attract or give up electrons. This is something we've done before. If you remember electronegativity from chemistry 20, things like fluorine and oxygen and chlorine were some of the highest electronegativity numbers on the periodic table. We later learned, especially when we were doing that uh, molecular unit, that this talked about how well or how strongly these guys could attract electrons. So fluorine with its small radius and valence shell held really, really close to its uh, nucleus meant that it had an extremely high ability to attract electrons. So our nonmetals generally have that trend of attracting electrons. And when we looked at single atoms, we came up with that electronegative number to help us describe this. Metals, on the other hand, when you look at some of those, like our alkali metals, had a really poor ability to do this. All right, and so rubidium and potassium, only 0.8 on a scale that was up to 4, showed that they had a horrible ability to attract electrons. So conversely, metals being opposite of nonmetals, they had a much better ability of giving them up or losing them. So we've had this idea before with electronegativity. What we're going to do now is rank them by strength of OA and RA, which is our Chem 30 or pardon me, uh, electrochemistry terminology that we want to use. ENAG was awesome, but only good for atoms. We don't have them for ions, we don't have them for compounds, and we certainly don't have them for combinations. So OA and RA and a table that describes the strength becomes our better way of ranking these guys and knowing which way electrons are going to go. So we're really just taking a look at that fight over valence electrons, the tug of war that might exist. And so if one can steal from the other, such as fluorine can easily take from sodium, all right, we generally see a very spontaneous, and even some cases with alkali metals and such, explosive reaction. So some things happen quite easily. There are other reactions that don't run so easily, called non-spontaneous reactions, which means your OA just doesn't have the strength to overpower an RA and take its electrons. Okay, we alluded to this idea with uh, molecule formation in which electrons had to be shared rather than transferred like they are in ionic compounds. Okay, so we take it one step further and we just think about high activation energies and stuff like that from thermo and realize that not all reactions are easily run. So we can get an idea of spontaneity, whether reactions happen or not, and we can also get a relative strength for how well these things can pull electrons from one another. So we can do experiments uh, to test for spontaneity here. And if we take a look at an experiment that's described here, this is also out of your textbook, we can see that silver, uh, pardon me, ionic solutions are being reacted with their uh, atomic or metallic counterparts. So silver ions are being reacted with silver metal, magnesium, nickel, and lead. Conversely, we see that happening to all the other ones. And if you take a look at the information, we found out that the silver ions, positive ions, something that's a very good OA, okay, and these guys, of course, like to get reduced, so they like to pull on electrons and take them from other things, we can see that the silver ion was actually pretty good at stealing it from other elements. Lead, not quite as good, was only able to steal from two. Nickel only was able to steal from one. And the magnesium ion, poor magnesium, couldn't steal from anyone. Okay, this relates to reactivity and therefore spontaneity. If you look at it and we had to rank these four OAs, which one would you say is the strongest? Or in other words, which one was the best at getting electrons? I think it's pretty obvious, silver ions are the best at getting those electrons. Magnesium ions were the worst at being able to get those electrons. Now, there are some uh, things that we can look at, going back to Chem 20, if we want to relate it there. Take a look at silver's electronegativity. Where did we go here? Silver, there you are. 1.9, not 
Not a huge number, but definitely bigger than our buddy here, magnesium, at 1.3. So magnesium doesn't have as strong ability as silver to pull electrons to itself. Now again, I wanted to say that we want to move beyond electronegativity, but that's a nice callback to Chem 20. We're going to use reactivity data to figure out which is best and which is worst, and so we saw silver ions react the most, magnesium rea ions reacted not at all, so we can rank these in order of OA strength. And so we can develop a table. If I develop a table that shows the strongest oxidizing agent on the top left, then the silver ion was the best at gaining electrons, remember OAs get reduced, to reduce to silver metal. Magnesium had to be the lowest on that uh, strength table. If the strongest are at the top left, then the weakest are at the bottom left, and magnesium had the lowest ability to gain its electrons to reduce to magnesium. Lead, we had noticed, if you look on that previous page, had reacted with two things. Nickel only reacted with one, and magnesium with none. So we have a decreasing strength of OAs as we go down this table by looking at the left. Now, on the other side of the coin here, if my ion is really, really bad at gaining electrons, then it makes sense that my magnesium, my uh, atom, is really, really good at giving them up. If it's hard to go this way in a reaction, it's probably easier to go back the other way. Remember, we did introduce this idea of forward and reverse reactions in the last unit. Okay, so if reduction is hard, then oxidation is likely easier. And so magnesium, iron, being a crappy thing at attracting electrons, means that magnesium metal, an alkaline earth metal, is probably really good at losing those electrons. And so the strongest reducing agents go at the bottom right. And then, of course, that decreasing strength or decreasing ability uh, to lose electrons is noticed as we go up the table. Because, again, if silver is really bad at losing them, silver ions are probably really good at gaining them. Okay, so it's just a reciprocal table that we have here. And, again, this table and the one that we have in our data booklet on page 7, all right, do show us a couple of different things. Okay, so we have OAs and RAs, therefore we have reduction, red left to right, and we have oxidation, red uh, right to left. If you remember back to thermo, we had a table of formation enthalpies, but if we reversed it, we had a table of decomposition enthalpies. Same thing is happening here. Again, we have reduction half reactions, like we're listing them here, and so therefore your strongest oxidizing agent is at the top, and your strongest reducing agent is at the bottom right. Okay, so this is a reduction half reaction table, which means you have OAs gaining electrons as you read it left to right. Flip it, and it's an oxidation table. So, to make these redox, tab redox tables, we do essentially what we just saw there, and that is make a table that has two columns, OAs on the left, RAs on the right, write them as reduction half reactions, and then list it so that the strongest oxidizing agent is on the top left, and that puts the strongest reducing agent on the bottom right. All right, these are fairly easy to construct. As we looked at this one, all right, in classes, it uh, makes a lot of sense when we talk about which one was most reactive and which one wasn't. So we can do a couple of examples here, or at least just one. Okay, here we have one in which a laboratory procedure is run and a student records observations after placing metal strips into uh, coordinating aqueous solutions. From the data that, uh, or the observations that were made, a data table is constructed in which NC represents no change and R represents reaction. So one of the first things we have to do when we're looking at this since we're trying to rank strength of OAs, I need to know which part of this is the OA. Is it these guys up here, or is it these ones here? Which one do you think represents the oxidizing agents and represents things that like to gain electrons? Is it the metal atoms? Are they really good at gaining electrons? Or is it the metal positive ions? Are they really good at gaining electrons? 
We can use that cheat sheet a couple pages ago, or we can use a little bit of logic here. Is a positive entity better at attracting electrons or a neutral one? Likely it's the positive, and so these are the OAs. Now that I know where they are, I can start looking for which one is the strongest. And if you go through, beryllium ion reacts once, cadmium ion reacts three times, radium not at all, and vanadium two plus ion reacts twice. This means that my cadmium is the most reactive OA and therefore the strongest. So I would write my cadmium ion, two plus aqueous, it's a two plus charge. If it's trying to turn into elemental cadmium, gain two electrons, and reduce to elemental cadmium. Vanadium was next. It's the second strongest. It reacted twice. And so the vanadium two plus ion also gains two electrons in this half reaction to reduce to solid vanadium, followed by beryllium. Finally, radium should round out my table here as the least reactive of the four RAs I assessed. And now I have a relative strength table. Please do a couple of uh, additional little things here just to make sure it's well communicated. Number one, this, these are reduction half reactions. And we put the strongest oxidizing agent on the top left with a decreasing ability of attracting electrons as we go down the table. Therefore, that puts the strongest reducing agent at the bottom right. Okay, so there you go. There's a, another example of just producing one of these tables. So in this first little bit here before uh, I sign off on this video and get to the next one, we are doing a couple of things. We can take evidential uh, data or some empirical data here and come up and make a table. We also have one that is done for us that we can interpret and research and find the relative rankings from. So right now in these ones, we're learning how these tables are made and we're going to build a couple more through a couple of different things and we're also going to develop a spontaneity rule from these tables. Okay, so this video is getting pretty long. I'm going to stop this one, go on to lesson two for 13.2 and continue on with the examples.